Hi everyone, um, I was part of the gear team, uh, scouting team. Uh, we went there after a week uh, of the earthquake and um, I'll be sharing with you our observations from the uh, reconnaissance mission and um, it will be fast-paced, a little bit of everything, just like our scouting mission. So as gear, our uh, main uh, target was to you know, get in early before the things have, uh, start to be getting uh, bulldozed over. Um, you know, assess the big picture, uh, help define objectives for subsequent teams because as a scouting mission we were not there to collect uh, detailed information but to you know, see the big picture and come up with a plan for the subsequent teams and disseminate information to various agencies and colleagues as fast as possible. So I split with my uh, colleague and teamed up with uh, Professor Altenel. Um, he's a local colleague and a friend and uh, we focused on surface structure and the infrastructure performance along the uh, surface structure. Um, and we specifically focused on the southern and northern terminations uh, of, of the rupture um, to see if there was a um, chance of uh, this rupture triggering other uh, adjacent segments. And also we tried to sample various um, impacts on the infrastructure. You all know this figure very well. Um, I think this is one of the first earthquakes that the aftershocks showed the you know, main uh, magnitude of the earthquake. It's 7.8. Um, and Basically, we went through the entire uh, magnitude 7.8 uh, earthquake rupture. I wanted to show this before because um, this is a figure from USGS website. Uh, Coulomb modeling is really useful, but um, it basically uh, we need to pay attention to you know which target faults are being this model is being uh, put together for. So in one model, you see you know mostly the stress increases towards the uh, Cypress uh, Cypress uh, arc, and then the other one is towards the both. The, Cypress Arc and the Dead Sea Fault. Dead Sea Fault is important because the northern end of the Dead Sea Fault hasn't experienced an earthquake for the last potential 600 years. So a very uh, suspicious fault uh, to be triggered with an earthquake like this. Uh, these points show um, our reconnaissance uh, points, um, both including our scouting team and the subsequent reconnaissance team A. Um, now I'm going to focus on the southern end of the rupture termination. This is near Hatay Airport. Um, the surface rupture starts to die out towards the airport, but it actually uh, crosses the airport. Um, here um, you see our track log around the airport. This is the airport location. And the surface rupture really down to about a meter or less uh, in this area, making classic initial steps towards the airport, ruptures through the airport. And this photo is from south of the airport. This is pretty much where the rupture dies. You still see the rupture without much of a displacement. And now you see this you know, beautiful uh, sand boil feature. Uh, again, south of the airport, we flew over the uh, rupture zone and uh, you know, trying to identify if it continues further south. And we also saw these um, really beautiful um, liquefaction features and lateral spreading along the LC River. Uh, one interesting observation is that the you know, electric transmission corridor in this area, the towers, performed really well. We also utilized our um, phone-based, phone-enabled lidar cameras and um, you know captured small features like this uh, sand boil. It really added to our um, tools uh, in the field, especially for uh, uh, rupture uh, reconnaissance. We also looked at our uh, levees in the Hatay area. Uh, there are extensive levees, and these levees performed fairly well in the areas that we visited. You know, you, you see a rupture going through a levee, but uh, it didn't really uh, com uh, completely collapse. Um, we paid attention because we also have very extensive levees in here in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Um, here's an example of our, in the upper right, a drone image of the oblique uh, field. You know, you see the primary fault rupture, and in the back you see secondary displacements uh, systematically offsetting uh, agricultural uh, features. Again, you see a LiDAR scan of a, a mole track. This is the primary fault rupture. And here in this one, you see the primary fault rupture here and then secondary uh, fault uh, traces. And here is a consistent that really offset um, stone wall. Um, we also paid attention to gas transmission uh, pipelines in the area as well as the surface rupture. There were a couple of leak uh, drone imagery. In some areas, the fault zone opens up and you know, creates a wider zone. In some areas, it's really concentrated and uh, you know, focuses the deformation in a very narrow zone. Uh, in this area, uh, the fault structure crosses the gas transmission pipeline. We didn't see an effect uh, in the field, but in other places,
cases, um, you know, the, the crossing orientation was probably not in an ideal uh, angle, and the pipeline ruptured um, dramatically. Uh, this is a video from the internet. Uh, you see the explosion uh, that night of the uh, event, and this is the site that we found. Uh, this is this is the surface rupture, and the pipeline exploded right about here. And this is a this is a major gas transmission pipeline, about 40 inches uh, thick. Uh, uh, diameter pipeline with a 1.2 centimeter wall thickness. We also looked at the uh, Surge fault. This is now the 7.5 rupture to the east of the 7.5 rupture. Uh, as you see from the maps, there's a gap between the 7.5 rupture and the 7.8 rupture. This is the east not only fault rupture location. This portion did not rupture and we want to check this in the field. Remember, this is only a week after the earthquake. Uh, we found the uh, circuit fault exactly where it is, um, but there was only one crack, so we think that this is basically uh, concentrated uh, earthquake waves along the uh, fault zone, but actually did not experience any displacement. Then we moved uh, further north uh, because we were told that the rupture extended to a town called Ozan, um, but we, we suspected it may have extended further north. Uh, you, know, you see the fault uh, geomorphology really beautiful as side hill benches and linear valleys. Um, we also saw this giant boulder here. This is about three to five meters diameter. And this boulder split during the earthquake. Um, and the locals uh, confirmed this. So some uh, records, uh, strong ground motion records, indicate that the, uh, the acceleration reached two Gs. I think this is a proof of that. It's analog, but it is a good record. Um, and then moving on to the north of the rupture. Uh, we went to this uh, village called Balukpurnu, and we found that the road uh, in this village was left laterally offset, and we followed that. We also saw that the uh, wall of this elementary school was left laterally offset. So we were able to inform the other uh, teams mapping the surface rupture at a more detailed pace that the rupture actually extends further, another about 70 to 80 kilometers to the northeast. We also uh, tried to sample other um, Hazards uh, such as the landslide, this is a road embankment failure. Uh, this is triggered by the strong ground motion. Uh, this one, this landslide here, is triggered probably by the surface rupture at the toe. And in some places, the gas transmission pipelines, again, this time uh, cross the uh, landslide. And, uh, you know, steel pipelines do not like buckling, so they, they can take a certain amount of buckling, but then they rupture and then they explode. So they were uh, replacing the pipeline in this area. And when you look at this oblique Google Earth imagery, you see the surface and this back scarp behind it. This surface used to be up here. We don't know if this landslide uh, was activated this much. If I can go back, maybe not. Okay, it only goes forward. <laughs> um, good timekeeping. Um, moving on, uh, electric transmission uh, infrastructure. Wherever we saw, it performed well, but uh, there are conflicting uh, information about that. Um, so subsequent teams paid specific attention to electric transmission corridors. Uh, we know that in some places electricity was lost, um, but in areas that we visited, they seem to be doing okay. Um, there was a highly variable performance of structures. So now I'm a geologist, I'm getting out of my comfort zone, but I need to share this with you, engineers, geotechnical engineers. Um, the variability in structural performance is astounding during this earthquake in this country, my country, I, I'm original Turkish. Uh, this is a hospital in Hatay. Uh, the building next to it uh, is standing fine. Uh, this one collapsed. These two bridges, well, one of them collapsed, one of them is performing beautifully. Um, this is a town called Gölbaşı. It literally means by the lake. Um, and the surface structure went through this town and there's extensive liquefaction and earth spreading in this town. This is one of my favorite photos, um, not because it shows destruction and damage, but in one panoramic photo, it explains and it demonstrates the variability in structural performance. Here you see a brand new building. It performed really well, not even a scratch. These next uh, four uh, buildings, not so fancy or new looking, they performed really well too. This one totally pancaked. Um, this one, the building structure was fine, but it tilted over because terrible foundation. The one behind it would have been fine, but the one in front of it collapsed and rammed into it. Uh, and this one, this is what you would mostly uh, you know, expect to see. You know, there is some damage, but it stands, so it fulfills life-saving criteria, and you know, it's uh, it's okay. So this one photo shows the variability in uh, structural performance. 
Now, I'm not a structural uh, engineer, but um, I know my career basically started uh, with the 99 earthquakes in this giant Kojedi. And all the regulations and laws changed after that earthquake, but the enforcement was not there. It's still probably not there. Um, so the variability in the structural performance, really people need to pay attention to this. Um, is, it basically depends on who built it, who is going to live in it, who paid attention to the codes, and who did not pay attention to the codes. So having the codes is not a solution on its own. Um, subsequent teams took these photos. Um, these are, you know, more detailed uh, mapping, uh, fault offset mapping uh, photos. This is from the 7.8. Uh, this is three and a half uh, meter offset on this one. And this is from the 7.5 rupture. 8.3 meters of offset on this one. But when I zoom in, I see these structures in the background, and you know, not far from these are surface structures with huge displacements and large magnitude earthquakes, and they are still standing. So there's no reason why we can't build accordingly uh, in these kind of areas and survive these earthquakes. It just takes a, um, a village to you know, basically achieve this. We know how to identify and characterize these geohazards. We know how to design and build in these environments in a safe and cost-effective way. It's not a uh, prohibitively cost expensive, expensive. Um, but it takes a collaborative effort. You need geologists, earth scientists, engineers, geotechnical engineers, civil engineers, planners, politicians, and owners of these uh, structures and people in these structures who live and purchase these things. They all need to be aware and basically pay attention. If you take one of these out of the equation, then we end up with man-made disasters like these. Thank you very much. Next, we're going to have three members 